God has some strange ways of doing things. His ways of fighting wars, of resolving conflicts seem peculiar, even bizarre. There isn't an army general alive who would approve of his strategy. See what you think. It is written. This is George Vanderman. Today It Is Written presents The Foolishness of Golgotha. Imagine, if you can, that you're a watchman atop the wall of the ancient city of Jericho. Jericho was a proud and wealthy city, located just inside the borders of the land that God had promised to deliver to the people of Israel, who were newly escaped from Egyptian slavery. It was a center of idol worship and heavily fortified. The city stood ready to defy the God of heaven. Well, one day as you watch from the wall, you see the army of ex-slaves approaching. Well, you smile at the idea of Jericho ever falling into their hands. This is going to be interesting. So what happens? A strange procession begins to circle the city. First is a company of selected warriors, then seven priests with trumpets. Next came priests in their sacred dress, bearing on their shoulders a golden chest, which appears to be surrounded with a halo of light. And then follows the entire army of Israel, each tribe under its own banner. There's no sound except the stealthy tread of marching feet, the solemn peal of the trumpets echoing among the hills and sounding through the streets of Jericho. Once around the city, and the army silently returns to the tents. What is going on? The same thing happens the next day and the next. There's something mysterious about this, something even terrifying. What can it mean? Well, you talk with the other watchmen. Authorities are made aware of every move by the Hebrew army. You remember that the Red Sea parted before these very people, that a passage has just been made for them through the Jordan River at flood stage? The Jordan is too close for comfort. What might the God of the Hebrews do next? Well, for six days, a single circuit of the city is made, nothing more. And now it's early morning on the seventh day of the siege, and something happens that is strange and foreboding. The army does not withdraw after marching once around the city. It continues a second time around, and a third, a fourth, six times around. What strange event is impending? What'll happen now? Well, you don't have long to wait. As the seventh circuit of the city is completed, the army pauses. The trumpets have been solid for a time, but now they break forth in a blast that simply shakes the earth. The walls of solid stone with their massive towers totter and heave from their foundations and crash to the earth. You can be glad that you were atop that wall only in imagination. What a way to take a city. What a seemingly ridiculous way. Just march around it blow the trumpets, but it worked. Now, in the days of Jehoshaphat, the good king of Judah, something equally strange happened. His country was invaded by an army that would make anyone tremble. The king, knowing that his own army was no match for the invaders, took his problem to the Lord. And then, with God's encouragement, what do you suppose he did? He put a band of singers at the head of his army and sent them out praising God for victory. Well, whoever heard of sending a choir out at the head of an army? Isn't that a little too much? But again, it worked. When the invaders heard the singers claiming victory, they were so frightened and confused that they simply turned on each other, destroying themselves. All Jehoshaphat's army had to do was to go into the enemy camp and take the spoil. Then there was Gideon. Gideon told, God told Gideon that 
he'd been chosen to deliver Israel from the neighboring Midianites. Now, Gideon had an army of 32,000 men, but God said that that was too many and told him to let every man who was afraid to go home. Well, 22,000 evidently were afraid. They went home, leaving only 10,000. But God still said, that was still too many, directed Gideon to give his men a little test for alertness, devotion to duty. Well, the test involved simply taking a drink at the creek. Now, most of the men got down on their hands and knees to drink, leisurely, but 300 of them, careful to be on the watch every moment, simply bent down a little, cupped a little water in their hands, and drank as they marched on. Well, Gideon was directed to send everybody home but the 300. Gideon trembled at the thought of the battle ahead, but with God's encouragement and under his direction, he divided those 300 into three companies, a hundred each, of course. Each man was given a trumpet and also a torch which was concealed in an earthen pitcher. Well, the three companies approached the enemy camp from di different directions in the dead of night. And on signal from Gideon's war horn, every trumpet was sounded. And then breaking their pitchers so that the blazing torches were displayed, they rushed upon the enemy with the cry, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Well, suddenly aroused from sleep, the enemy's soldiers saw flaming torches on every side. From every direction came the sound of the trumpets and the cry of Gideon's men. Thinking that they were being attacked by an overwhelming force, the Midianites were panic-stricken. Fleeing for their lives, they mistook their companions for enemies and destroyed one another. What strange ways of fighting! Blowing trumpets, breaking pitchers, shouting! Why such unconventional methods? We find the answer in the direction that God gave to Gideon. Listen to this over here in Judges, the seventh chapter. Judges, the seventh chapter, gives us the clue. Look, and the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many for me to give Midian into their hands. Notice, lest Israel become boastful, saying, my own power has delivered me. Do you see? God works in ways so simple, so seemingly ridiculous, so lacking in potential, so unlikely to produce results. He does this so that we can never say that we did it ourselves. It was that way in the days of the prophet Elijah. A number of times on this telecast, we've described the confrontation on Mount Carmel between Elijah and 400 prophets of sun worship. Now, this was not a military conflict. It was far more serious. Here it was to be demonstrated once and for all, with all of the people watching, who was the true God? It was one of the greatest confrontations of all time. You recall that Elijah suggested a plan for resolving the issue. The prophets of Baal reluctantly agreed. They were to place a sacrifice on their altar and call upon their God to send fire to consume it. Then Elijah would do the same. The God who sent fire would be the true God. Well, the proposal was too fair to reject. So the prophets of Baal prepared their sacrifice. And then they cut themselves and shouted incantations and pleaded and demonstrated until late in the afternoon. But nothing happened. They gave up. So everybody watched as Elijah repaired the altar of the Lord and placed his sacrifice on it. But wait, what is he doing? He commands the people to flood the sacrifice and the wood and the altar and the trench he has made around it. He asks them to flood it with water, 12 barrels of it. You see, that's not very smart. He doesn't even know how to build a fire. He expects that to burn, but Elijah offers a simple prayer, and immediately flames of fire like brilliant flashes of lightning descend from heaven, consuming the sacrifice, licking up the water in the trench, and consuming even the stones of the altar. Ah, oh, yes, friend, God knows how to use atomic energy. 
consuming even the stones. Yes, God has a plan of making, has a way of making it plain by doing the simple thing that may even seem not very smart. I say God makes it plain that there's no way man could have done it. He himself has been at work. So when God, back in eternity, was confronted with the greatest crisis of all, the entrance of sin into his perfect universe, it is no wonder that he did not meet that crisis in the way that we might expect. Here was a conflict involving not a single person, not a single group, not a single world, but the entire universe. God's character had been called in question. God himself was on trial. His government had been challenged. The fate of all God's creation was at stake. How would God respond? With massive force? With his superior power? Would he extinguish rebellion with one great mushroom cloud? Now, casting Satan and his sympathizers out of heaven was a necessary step. But remember that that didn't end that conflict. It was just the beginning. How could the issue be resolved before the watching universe? That was the question. How could the character of the character of the accused be unmasked before all of the worlds? How could God be vindicated as a God who loves and cares? And how could he at the same time make a way of escape for a lost race on a distant planet? God made his decision. He would fight rebellion, my friend, with a cross. A radical plan? Unexpected? Tragic? Extreme? Costly? Yes, all of these. And some have called it foolish. Well, when the time was ripe, the Son of God, in whose heart Calvary had long been hidden, came personally to this planet to implement the plan and to challenge Satan's rule. And Jesus went about it in ways that seemed to violate all the rules of getting ahead. Certainly you would expect one on so important a mission to arrive with great fanfare, wouldn't you? Instead, Jesus was born in a manger, lived out his life in poverty. He grew up in a small town, confined his real work to a short three and a half years in a small, insignificant country, Now, why didn't he move into the spotlight of the world's large cities if he wanted to be noticed? He never led an army in protest. He never marched in revolt or brought a revolution. He never published a newspaper. He never wrote a book. He bypassed the meeting halls and talked with people who gathered around him on the hillside or out by the sea. And by the way, why didn't he postpone his visit to this planet until the advent of television? He could have captured the attention of the whole world overnight if he had done so. Wouldn't that have been a smart thing? I wonder. Listen, Jesus died at 33 without leaving a mark on the world. So it seemed. Yet millions would die for that humble, travel-worn teacher who quietly taught and healed and loved and then died in our place. Especially surprising was the way that Jesus went about choosing his close associates, the leaders on whose shoulders his work would rest when the time came for him to leave this planet. You'd expect him to search out some rabbi with whom he had talked at the temple, you remember, at the age of 12, and say, look, I remember you, your brilliant mind. I'm ready to go public now. I'd like you to be on my team. No. Instead, he went down to the docks to find his helpers. He made theologians out of fishermen. Why? Why? When the palaces were filled with great men. Why? When the campuses were packed with students of Plato and Aristotle. Why? When the country was swarming with scribes and Pharisees who knew the law backwards and forward. Fishermen. What was he thinking of? Is it possible that only the fishermen were willing to be taught? Listen, I think so. The Apostle Paul said something very surprising 
over here in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 and 27. Listen to this. Paul said it. Not many wise men, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Yes, those humble fishermen became the devoted disciples of Jesus, but even in their eyes, he did some strange things. They believed him to be the Messiah, the promised Messiah, but he didn't always behave in the way they expected a Messiah to behave. To behave. And all this time, Judas was watching. Judas, the most talented of the twelve. Judas, considered by his fellow disciples and by himself a great asset to the team. Judas, who thought Jesus needed some coaching in public relations. Judas, who thought Jesus missed all the cues. Jesus could easily have led a revolt against Rome and taken the throne of David if only he'd played it right. But he missed all his opportunities. He seemed to have no sense of timing. When the tide of public opinion had turned his way and the people were ready to make him king, he sent the crowd home, went off in the mountain to pray. He seemed to have no strategy. If he was ever to take the throne, he'd have to get his cues better than that. So reasoned Judas. And then finally, at the feast of Simon's house, came the last straw. That is in the mind of Judas. Jesus, who could have been anointed king, permitted a woman of ill repute to pour the fragrant and costly contents of an alabaster box over his head and his feet. What a waste! Then she knelt, weeping, moistening her, his feet with her tears, drying them with her long, flowing hair. And Jesus defended her saying that she had come to anoint his body for burial. This was too much. Surely a man with such poor judgment could not be the Messiah. A man like that deserved to be sold to his enemies, and Judas bowed out. Judas, like the leaders of Israel, would gladly have accepted Jesus as the lion of the tribe of Judah, but not as the lamb about to be slain. They wanted a conqueror. They didn't want a lamb. Even the closest disciples of Jesus were, were soon to be disappointed, for Jesus had not come to lead a revolt against Rome and take the throne of David. He was a man born to be crucified. For that purpose he had come to this planet. The path from Bethlehem led straight to Calvary and nothing could divert him or lure him from that blood-stained way. The hopes of his followers reached a peak that Sunday as he rode triumphantly into Jerusalem, accompanied by the waving of palm branches and the shouting of his praise. Surely he was about to assume power. But only days later he let himself be led by his enemies out of the city to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. He let them put him on a rough, splintery cross, the hated emblem of Roman oppression. He offered no protest as the sail soldiers nailed him to its crossbars, then jolted the cross into its place. Now he who had come to save others appeared to need saving himself. His tormentors looked on in compassionless scorn, as he said over here, recorded in Matthew 27. Verse 42, Matthew 27, verse 42, listen. He saved others. Himself he cannot save, and never were truer words spoken. Listen, friend, it all looked like a big mistake. The hopes of his closest followers were crushed, and they said in their own hearts, recorded over in Luke, the 24th chapter and the 21st verse, listen to this, we trusted but we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. But then while those he loved were doubting, a thief was calling upon Jesus to remember him. And a stranger named Simon 
was thanking God for the privilege of carrying his cross. And a Roman centurion was saying, truly, this was the Son of God. Yes, what happened that day at Golgotha looked like foolishness to ambitious men. But God knew what he was doing. What appeared to be a terrible mistake was the most brilliant love move that love could make. What looked like ignominious defeat turned out to be love's finest hour. It was the cross that unmasked the enemy of God before all of the universe. It was the cross that sealed the doom of Satan. It was the cross that conquered death. It was the cross that he eternally vindicated the character of God. And it was the cross that answered every charge of the accuser. It was the cross that demonstrated who it was who cared. Listen again to the Apostle Paul. Listen, for the Jews require a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified under the Jews a stumbling block and under the Greeks foolishness, but under them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. The foolishness of Golgotha, sheer nonsense to those who don't understand, but the wisdom of earth's most brilliant intellects pales before it. The message of the early church was not news of a military victory, as they'd hoped. Instead, they spread the word everywhere, Jesus is Lord, and you crucified him. And it didn't send men rushing to be on the winning side. It sent them to their knees asking, how can we get our hands clean? The message is still the same today. Where can we get our hands clean? Where can we get rid of our guilt? And you don't go to the bandwagon of a recruiting office for that. You go to Golgotha's cross. Said Jesus, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And that power is in the wounds in his hands. In those wounded hands is power enough to lift you up, whoever you are, no matter how far down you may have fallen. I urge you just now, to take your guilt to Golgotha's cross and come away clean. Listen to this. Oh, now I see the crimson wave, the fountain deep and wide. Jesus, my Lord, mighty to save, points to his wounded son. The cleansing stream I see, I see, I plunge and oh, it cleanseth me. Oh, praise the Lord, cleanseth me, it cleanseth me, yes, cleanseth me. Me, 
It cleanseth me, yes, cleanseth me. Thank you, Marilyn Cotton and Walter Artis. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, in your unorthodox way, do for these poor hearts of ours what needs to be done to wash and clean them up. We trust you, for then we cannot be tempted to say that we did it. Save us by the foolishness of Golgotha. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. My name is Lonnie Meloshenko. Those of you who are regular viewers of the telecast are able to build a small library of It Is Written books and scripts, and we hope all of you will do just that. Don't hesitate to write in week after week. These materials are yours as our gift, with never any cost or obligation. Today we're offering you a copy of the script of today's message, The Foolishness of Golgotha. We thought you would like to have it. In just a moment, we'll tell you how to ask for your copy. Be sure to ask for the script by name, The Foolishness of Golgotha, so we'll know just what to send. And now, here is the information you need. You may request Pastor Vandeman's free offer by writing directly to It Is Written, Box O, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. The offer is sent by mail, free and postpaid. Our address is easy to remember. Just It Is Written, Box O, that's Box Zero, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. Please be sure to ask for the offer by name and we'll put it into the mail right away. It takes only a few moments to write, but it could mean a lifetime of satisfaction. While you're writing down the address, let me remind you to invite a friend to watch It Is Written with you next week on this station. The address again is It Is Written, Box O, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. Please mention the offer by name and write It Is Written, Box O, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. Goodbye, everyone, but remember it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. <laughs>